Well, I uh, read of a couple, um, husband and wife, they had been married for 50 years. I mean, 50 years. That's a, that's a major feat of accomplishment. And, and this uh, couple, they were sitting on the couch one day, and they were reminiscing about how things had changed. And, and she, she was like, do you remember when we first got married? You used to sit so close to me. He was at the other end of the couch, and he was like, oh, okay, and so he kind of scooted on over and then came and sat next to her, and she was like, well, do you remember that, that you used to just like, you just hug me and wrap your, your arms around me, and, and he was like, oh, okay, you know, I'm, I'm getting the hint here, honey, I'm getting the hint, and, and he put his arm around her and just, how's that, and she was like, yeah, that's good, and she, she then replies, and do you remember how, how you used to, you know, give me little kisses on my neck and, and nibble my ears? And, and at that moment, he got up and he started walking out the room. And she was like, well, where, are you, where are you going? And he was like, well, you know, if, if you really want me to nibble your ears, I got to go get my teeth. They're on, <laughs> on the bed next to, next to my bed. You know, there's something within us built within all of us, this desire, you could say a desire to um, live a well-pleasing to the Lord life. Um, there, there is a desire for us as believers specifically to finish the race well, to um, run the race well. And, and all of us, I, I don't know about you, but I would assume the majority of us looks at our life and says, you know what, when I get to this age, when I, when I finally get to the point of my life where you know, I'm, I'm ready to, uh, what we would call give up the ghost, ready to die, I, I want to be able to say that my life was well, that, that things were, were good, uh, die with a smile on my face. You know, none of us looks at, at our lives and says, well, yeah, you know, when I turn 80, I want my wife to hate me, my kids to never talk to me, and Social Security to be gone. You know what I mean? Like, none of us looks at our lives and, and says that. No, we, we want to live a, a life that is well-pleasing to the Lord, a, a life that is complete. You know, I, I think about my life and, and the idea of, you know, me getting to my 80s, and, and I think, man, like how, I can't wait, like, you know, to get to my 80s and, and, and sit on the front porch with my wife and, and, you know, have my diet Mountain Dew and flaming hot Funyuns there eating them. And, and I might not make it to my 80s if I keep drinking diet Mountain Dew and eating flaming hot Funyuns, but they're so good. I'm telling you, the combination will change your life. It will. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I look at getting to my 80s and I, and I think like, man, I can't wait to get to that point and think, man, all that God did through my life and, and, and what God would do through our church and, and seeing my kids there with their kids and my grandkids and, and them playing on the front you know, lawn. And I just, I think about those things and how awesome it would be, you know, and then coming to church on a Sunday morning and, and getting up here and preaching. I'm sure there'll be some younger guys uh, taking over the mantle at that point, but, but being able to stand up here in my 80s and, and preach and and, you know, there'll be some things that, there are some things I could, you can get away with in your 80s that I can't get away with in my 30s. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes I'll say things, and I'm sure some of you are like, someone's got to tell him, like, you can't say those things, uh, you know, or, or I'm going to teach that young whippersnapper something, you know, and just come up and tell me, tell me something. But when I'm 80, and I'm up here and I say something crazy, you guys would be like, oh, he's 80. You know, like, well... There's nothing, I'll be afforded a little bit more crazy at that time, you know? But there's this idea of, of, of finishing the race well, the desire to have um, finished the race well. And the reality is, though, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed that I'm going to make it to my 80s. Um, there are things in this life such as cancer and car accidents and, you know, we, we might not make it to the, the end of our lives um, the way that we might dream of in our mind. You know, we might not fulfill those things perfectly in every area. We will have regrets as we make our way uh, along our life. You know, sins that we've long repented of that might still haunt us, but God in his faithfulness can still work and move and get the glory. And from what we know of Solomon, you know, he didn't finish the race really well. Um, he kind of took a, a left turn at stupid <laughs> and, and sinned. He messed up. 
Um, we know he eventually had 700 wives and 300 mistresses. We know that he let idols come into the home that were not um, dedicated to the Lord. And, but that doesn't negate the wisdom that he offers here in Song of Solomon chapter 8. The Holy Spirit obviously gave us this chapter for a reason and for a purpose. And, and we should dive in deep to say that no matter the things that, that I've done or the, no matter the things that Solomon did from this day forward, I'm going to work to be faithful. I'm going to work to finish my race well. And what we see in Song of Solomon 8 really is a, a culmination of two people, a man and a woman who've weathered the years, a man and a woman who have, um, you could say, come from the other side of, of the bumpy roads and, and the wilderness of marriage, of what it can seem to be at times, and made it to the end. And that's where we're at today. So I've titled this morning's message, if you're taking notes, From This Day Forward. And we'll be looking at, at really three points, three ways we as believers can, can finish the race well within our marriages. And there are other areas as well, not just our marriages, but friendships, um, our employers, employees, so on. We'll, we'll look at some of those things. But really just how to cultivate a good marriage relationship. And we'll be looking at chapter 8, verse 5 through 7, our first point, that you've got to cultivate love. Our second point would be verses 8 through 10, you've got to cultivate a legacy. And then, closing it out, verse 13 through 14, you've got to cultivate longing, a longing for one another. And then we'll, we'll draw some application at the end. Now, if this is your first time or you haven't been with us uh, in a while, I... I, I always like to set the scene so we're all moving in the right direction. I know for those of you that are here every single week, you hear this and you're like, he's going to say it again. Yes, I'm going to say it again. But it's good for all of us to be moving um, in the right direction because we might have some new people here or some people that haven't been with us in a while. We are finishing the Song of Solomon, so uh, you missed all the other messages. Just letting you know. Um, but uh, we are finishing the Song of Solomon, and the Song of Solomon is, is a book that, while well, we would maybe call a little bit risque because of its subject content. It's, it talks a lot about sex and uh, marriage and relationships, engagement and dating, and, and, and all of those things that have to do with marriages and, and so on. It, it talks a lot about those things, and, and we're going through it because we as a church believe that all Scripture is God-given, it's God-breathed, it's, it's there for a reason and for a purpose, as Second Timothy would tell us. And, and so we're going through it because, well, if anybody should be um, speaking on sex and intimacy and those things, it should be the church. What? The church? Why the church? Because we serve the God who created it. We serve the God who created marriage in, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. He brought them together. Um, we serve the God who gave us a sex drive. All right, and I've said this over and over again, it's okay to have a sex drive, you just can't let sex drive, right? You can't give it the keys to your life because it'll drive you into a ditch. But it's okay to have these feelings and emotions and desires and so on. God gave them to us for a reason and for a purpose. And because culture is continually pushing what I would say is a warped view on marriage, a warped view on uh, dating and and relationships and intimacy on our young people, um, man, I, I believe we as a church should be responding in the right direction. How do we um, talk about romance and intimacy and sexuality and all of those issues? And so the Song of Song plays out this amazing story of this young couple. And the first half of the book we dedicated to singles, um, who to date, how to date, um, engagement, um, finding a person that doesn't just look good. Why? Because um, age happens, right? You guys know what I mean? Um, gravity sets in. Um, things change in your body. And, and so not finding a person that just look, looks good. I mean, you want to be attracted to them for sure. You're going to have to look at that mug for the next 50 years. You know, like you want to make sure you're attracted to them. But the idea isn't just about the looks. It's about um, finding someone that has character, 
someone that has good character, deep character, um, someone that's honorable, someone that loves the Lord. And so the first half of the book, focusing on that, and, and we saw this young couple, Solomon and the Shulamite woman, his, his bride, go from dating and, and friendship and attraction to a, a deeper form of dating called courtship, and then engagement, and then we saw them get married in their marriage ceremony, and then we, we were with them on their honeymoon night. Awkward, right? And then... Um, you know, we, we, we kind of spent that time, and then it went from their engagement and, and their wedding ceremony and their honeymoon night to them coming home, being married. And when we saw them get into their first fight and how to resolve conflict and how do you um, deal with those things and, and so on. And, and then um, we saw them a couple weeks ago go on a little getaway um, and, and spend some time together. Chapter 7 is probably the most intimate of all the chapters in, in all of Song of Solomon. It talks a, a lot about, there's a lot of words like palm trees and clusters and, and you know, bellies and navels, oh my, you know, there's... There's a lot of stuff like that, and the reason being is because Song of Solomon is Hebrew in its poetic nature. Remember, this is a song. It's the song of songs, and, and it's really this musical between a man and a woman and how they love one another and care for one another, and what we see here is this story comes to an end, and Solomon gives us some insight in how to end our stories great how to end our, um, our lives in, in a way that would be pleasing and honoring to the Lord with, within specifically our marriages. So notice our first point, that you've got to cultivate love. Chapter 8, verse 5 through 7, it tells us, Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree, and there your mother brought you forth. There, she who bore you brought you forth. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his, of his house, he would be utterly despised. Remember last week they went, or two weeks ago, they went on a little weekend getaway. And now they're coming back up out of the wilderness. Notice we see them coming up out of the wilderness. They're probably riding the royal chariot in full display of others to see. This idea or reference of wilderness probably is in reference to the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. Um, remember, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they, they roamed the wilderness for 40 years, um, kind of just going back and forth. What should have been a two-week, three-week journey ended up being 40 years. And the idea, I believe, what Solomon's trying to convey, remember, Hebrew poetry, he's speaking of things that are much deeper than, than just uh, uh, clusters and palm trees and so on. He's speaking of things much deeper. And it's probably this reference to the children of Israel coming up out of the wilderness after spending 40 years in it. You could say this couple has weathered the storms. This couple, maybe they're either, they've either been married for 40 years or, or whatever the case might be. They've come out of the bumps on the road of life. They've made it through the desert, and they're on the other side. Their love relationship has, has really been redeemed by God's grace, and they're really enjoying one another. How do we know? Notice she's leaning upon her beloved. She's, she's just got her, her head on his shoulder and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're hanging out so much so that their families see it. Remember this lady, the Shulamite woman, um, we don't know her name. We call her the Shulamite woman because she was from the region of Shulamah. And, and so this lady at the beginning of the book had so many different insecurities Remember, she, she said, don't look upon me because I am dark and the sun has tanned me. 
that was really a, a bad thing in that day. Today, we pay um, companies to go get a tan, um, but in that culture, it was you did not want to be tanned. Why? Because if you were tanned, it meant you worked out in the fields. You weren't uh, someone that stayed inside and was pampered and fed grapes. You know, like that you work, you were a worker. And so her insecurities were based off of her looks. Um, Don't look upon me because the sun has tanned me. Um, My brothers made me work in the fields. And and so she had these insecurities. But now we we make our way to the end of the book. And you could say um, those insecurities have subsided. Why? Because she now seems to have a real joy, a real peace. You could say she sees it in her, you, you, you can see it in her face. She's comfortable with who she is. She's leaning upon her beloved. She, she desires that, that she be a seal set upon his heart. And one of the only ways we can really make it through our marriage relationships and the bumpy roads we overcome the, the what would seem like wilderness times is the word that is used many times in this section of scripture, the word love. Notice she says, for love is as strong as death. Um, floodwaters can't quench love. The word love here is the Hebrew word ahava. Ahava. Just say it like that. Ahava. It's a, it's a, it's a word that describes really a digging in kind of love. It's a, a quite literal meaning. Is it's, it's a love that clings to or a love that says, I'm not going anywhere. If we're going to make it to the end of our lives, we will have to often lean into this type of love for our spouse we will, by God's grace, need to access that type of love over and over and over again. It's a, it's a, a digging in kind of love, a love that says, I am going to be here no matter what. Notice what she says. She says that I want it to be a seal upon your arm. This seal speaks of really uh, something made of a very expensive metal. Typically, it was a family signet ring um, that you would press a seal into a letter. It l- meant that you were now able to uh, do business for the family, and it was the equivalent of having the family's um, pin code to the ATM. Like It meant that you were able to uh, do business for the family, run the taxes, and so on and so forth. And what she says is, I want um, to know that The most important possession in my husband's arsenal, you could say, is me. She says that this love that they have is as strong as death. It's the only time the word strong is used in the Song of Solomon. And so what does it mean? Well, ultimately, we know what death is, right? Death is universal. It affects every person. The statistics are staggering. One out of one person dies. Everybody uh, will come to that end. And so um, what, what, is, what is she saying in, in speaking that their love is as strong as death? What she's quite literally saying is that nothing can put out the flame to their love, not even death. The, she, sa- she says that the, the floodwaters can't quench their love. If, if she was singing this, well, she is singing it because it's a song, Song of Solomon. But if modern day words, she's, she's looking at her husband and she's like, ain't no mountain high enough, right? Ain't no, right? You guys know the words. She, no mountain high enough, no valley low enough, nothing is going to keep me from you. She says if a man would give all of his wealth for love, he would be despised, meaning love can't be bought. Oh, oh, sure, yes, there are people um, who will pay for sex, even today in our, our modern culture, prostitution, and so on, but love is not something that can be bought. People might even try to um, earn love by giving gifts, but love cannot be bought. Love is something that is freely given. And she says that our love will not be despised. It's to be protected. Ahava 
love, Ahava love, is, is faithful to the end. Because we as Christians serve the God who gives us the same. Jesus would never abandon us, Ahava love. Jesus would never forsake us, Ahava love. And that's the type of love that if we want to make it to the end, we've got to cultivate in our own marriages, in our own friendships, dealing with maybe our own family members and, and, and our own kids and, and so on. A type of love that says, I'm digging in. It's faithful to the end. We are to be um, a, a group of people that won't bail when the going gets tough. I think one of the bigger lies that we as Christians have a tendency to believe is that somehow, some way, that if I find someone and I get married to them, that somehow that person is going to complete me because Jerry Maguire told me, you know? But the reality is, is a person doesn't complete you, earthly speaking. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your God, as your Savior, you are already complete because of him. You're made whole because of Jesus Christ. A person will never complete you. They will fail you. Jesus won't. They will sin against you. Jesus won't. We are made whole and perfect in Jesus and in who he is. And this is the reason why that Ahava type of love is so necessary within a marriage relationship because remember, marriage isn't 50-50. Marriage is 100-100 because there are going to be days when that person's not going to give you 100% that you've got to fill in the gap where you say, you know what, no matter what you do, if you're only giving me 49%, I'm still giving you 100%. Why? Because I'm sticking it out. Ahava love it's kind of like the, the Alamo. You guys remember the Alamo? You guys remember what happened at the Alamo? This is what happened at the Alamo. It's a story of a group of men who were outnumbered. They stood their ground and said, bring it, and then they died. All of them. They dug in their boots and they said, we are stained. No matter how difficult the marriage is, because it will be difficult, no matter how um, hard it is, because there will be difficult days, there will be frustrating behavioral patterns from your spouse, there might even be points of crisis, no matter how hard it is, Ahava love digs in and says, if I die, I die. I'm sticking it out. Bring on the flood because Ahava love can't be quenched. Bring on the poverty, because Ahava love is better than riches. Bring on the death, because Ahava love won't die. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Fernando, but you don't know what they've done. You don't understand what's taken place. You're right. There are stories and things that I've, I've had counseling appointments with people, probably some of you, where It'll make you sick to your stomach, the things that have happened and taken place. And we can't go into all of those things today. There are areas and categories that the Bible does address that we don't have time for, um, that we've covered in some regard throughout Song of Solomon and in other areas when we've talked about marriage. Um, you know, there are things like um, serial adultery and, and abandonment and physical abuse and and those types of things, I would never, ever, ever, listen, you guys, many of you know my backstory. I come from an abusive home where I was beat on a daily basis and I saw my mom get beat by a drug addicted father. I would never, ever, ever tell a, a woman, well, you know what, you've just got to stick it out for the day and just take the beating, you know, every day you get home. No, 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 no. But there are remedies for us to be able to talk about some of these things. It means if you got to call the cops, you got to call the cops, all right? It, it means, you know, we've got to talk to pastors, we've got to talk to pastors. I'm not talking about those types of sins and those types of things that are happen and take place within a marriage. Um, I'm talking about the everyday normal sins that happen within a marriage. Let's talk about these things. 
Let's, you know, put, it, put them on the shelf. Let's speak on these issues. If you want to talk about these things personally and privately, let's do that. What I'm talking about, the Ahava type of digging in kind of love, is the, the type of love um, that deals with the normal sins of marriage, the messiness of this broken world. The, the things that are difficult and, and crazy that, that we need to remember we have vows, seals for a certain reason and for a certain purpose. And that's why we've got to cultivate the attitude of Ahava, um, uh, the, that type of love, so that in the darkest of days, you know, in the wilderness where it seems like our marriage is just wandering, we, um, you know, when all hope seems lost, it says, you know what, I'm going to dig in. Well, yeah. Abuse, adultery, abandonment, let's talk about those things. I'm talking about the time your husband, you know, was a jerk because he wouldn't clean the basement and want to watch the football game, you know? Like, we're talking about the everyday things, you know? Those areas, those issues. You got to cultivate a hava love. Number two, you got to cultivate legacy. Legacy, verse 8 through 12. It says, we have a little sister. She has no breasts. Thanks. It's a little TMI. <laughs> what shall we do for our sister in the day when um, she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. If she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I am a wall, and my breasts like towers. And then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hamon, and he leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruits a thousand silver coins. My own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruits, two hundred. Notice what we see here in verse 8. Notice there's, some of your versions might have a title above it. It says, the Shulamites brothers. Who are they to Solomon? The in-laws. You know, part of getting married is that you now inherit um, family. We call them in-laws. Some of you call them outlaws, you know? Like, some of you, you know? Listen, I'm blessed to say um, that I, you know, I, I love my in-laws. Um, we have a, a really good relationship. Not only do I have um, in-laws, I have really, really great in-laws. That's, that's how you wanted me to put it, right, hon? That's, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, I've got good in-laws. I, I love my father-in-law. He's a good man. Um, and and my, my, my wife's uh, sisters and their husbands, we all get along, and, and they're great people. We, I, I sometimes enjoy, you know, spending time with them more than my own family sometimes. Well, we'll delete that from the podcast. Um, no, I... You know, I love my in-laws, but sometimes in-laws get a bad rap. They do. Someone once said that Adam and Eve probably had the happiest of marriages because they never had to deal with the in-laws, you know? <laughs> they, they didn't. I did hear a story about a, a, a guy um, who uh, was basically, he went to the doctor, middle-aged man, and, and uh, was diagnosed that he was going to die. He had six months to live. Um, and, and so the, the doctor said, you need to get all of your affairs in order. You need to handle everything, you know, make sure everything's taken care of. You know, maybe last minute vacation, spend time. I mean, it's a true story. And um, he, uh, he, said, uh, he said, so what are you going to do now? And he's like, well, I'm, I'm going to move in with my mother-in-law. He was like, you're going to move in with your mother-in-law? Why would you, you have six months to live. Why, why would you move in with your mother-in-law? And he's like, well, you know, if I only got six months to live, it's going to be the longest six months of my entire life. You know, I just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't send me an email. Listen, the Bible doesn't really speak specifically on the subject of in-laws, but we do, or at least we are given some insight uh, through stories in the Bible. We know that Rebecca uh, wanted a, a good wife for her son. You know, she, she desired a good spouse for her son. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, Ruth and Naomi, you know, a daughter and mother-in-law, great phenomenal story of, of how things can, can work out for God's glory. Um, we've seen, some, we, you see some bad um, in-law situations in the Bible. You guys might remember the story of Jacob and Laban, um, 
Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and he, uh, he, he goes to Laban and says, can I marry Rachel? And, and um, he says, yeah, but you're going to have to work seven years to marry her. And so he works seven years. Um, he's you know, working in the fields, just w- waiting for that day that he finally gets to marry Rachel. And on his wedding night, his father-in-law Laban pulls an old switcheroo and marries off Leah, the older sister, that said, it said she had a lazy eye. Like, and, and so... I'm telling you, when I'm 80, I get to save in crazier things. Um, but, but the idea, then Laban's like, well, you know, oh, I didn't know you wanted Rachel. Oh, you know, but you married Leah. Sorry, tough luck. You know, if you want Rachel now, you got to work another seven years. I mean, just like shady father-in-law. Um, there, there was a great story of Moses and Jethro. You guys remember Moses and Jethro, his his father-in-law, um, Moses, was dealing with the children of Israel, roughly two million people in the wilderness, and he just he couldn't handle any more emails. He was just tired of the emails. People were complaining about everything, and, and so Jethro, his father-in-law, said, listen, you've got to get some good people in there. You've got to, you've got to raise up some leaders. Um, his father-in-law was looking out for him. Uh, there's Peter, remember? Peter and his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law lived with him in his house. She was sick, and he asked Jesus to come over and heal her. I mean, great stories of, of in-laws. In-law relationship can be difficult. Keeping the peace can be difficult. But as believers, we're called to a higher calling, whether our in-laws are great, not so great, whether they're unbelievers, or maybe they're jealous of the relationship you have now with your spouse, and uh, whatever the case is, Jot down Romans chapter 12, verse 16 through 18. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. For us, we've got to cultivate a good legacy with our in-laws to show the love of Jesus. That even if they're your enemy, you're called to love them. Not just the in-laws, notice the Shulamites brothers, but also the children, our own kids. Notice we see here in verse 8, it says we have a little sister. She has no breasts. The idea that, that it's speaking of here is that uh, this is a young lady who hasn't hit puberty yet. She is a young woman who hasn't hit puberty yet, and, and so the brothers um, are calling out to protect her. Now, isn't that the dad's job? Well, yes, but we, we don't ever hear about the Shulamite's father, whether he died or, or divorced, so the brothers took up the mantle. And, and so they decide to um, protect her. Notice they said, if she's a wall, we'll build her up. If she is a door, we'll enclose it. Um, there are two ways of thinking about this. One, a, a wall is built to keep people out, and a door is uh, to let people in. And the idea that they're speaking of here is they're taking her purity um, to, to a, a new level. They want to make sure she is protected. Um, if if she is a, a, a wall, meaning nothing can get in, they're going to make sure she's even more protected. And if she is a door allowing anyone and everyone, what we would maybe call um, someone who is loose and open, they're going to take the initiative to tighten the reins in her life. As parents, you got to guard your kids. You've got to guard your kids. You got to pay attention to how they dress. And if they can't make their own decisions well, To be a wall, notice, you make it for them. To protect them. No one one ever grows up and says, man, my parents protected me from purity and I got married a virgin. What a bummer. (laughs) Nobody ever says that. No, No. Typically, you'll hear, man, my parents set up these walls and these parameters and I'm so grateful that they did. The reality is, is, is we've got to take the initiative. We've got to make sure that they're protected, that they're taken care of. You know, I, I want to make sure that like my daughters are, are protected and taken care of. And for that time when, when they get married and God calls them to be married when they're like 48. And, um, you know, like in that time that I'm able to say, you know, hey, young man, I've set up a walls and parameters. Um, listen, here she is. 
And then the, the shift goes from me as the dominant male figure in her life to her husband now being the dominant male figure in her life. And the same with my son, making sure that he's raised up in purity and protection. And, and I put, you know, filters and I'm checking his iPod every day. And, and, you know, like we're making sure that these things are taken care of so that he can't go onto websites, protect his mind, his heart, his eyes, you know, so that, you know, he, I can present him to a young lady and, and, and say, here, you know, he, here he is. And his mom will go from the dominant female figure in his life to now his wife being the dominant female figure. We've got to make sure that we develop a good legacy. We see it throughout Song of Solomon over and over and over and over again. Do not stir up or awaken love before it's time. Do not stir up or awaken love before it's time. We see it four or five times in this book. And so we've got a younger generation young kids who haven't hit puberty maybe yet, that we want to make sure that we cultivate a good legacy. And Solomon and his wife, you could say that they've done that. They've developed and cultivated a good legacy. And they're imparting their wisdom now. Notice her brothers are asking, like, we got a little sister, what do we do? Like, and they're imparting their wisdom now. One of the things, I'll tell you this, one of the things that drives me nuts, I'll say, just speaking frankly, you can disagree with me. That's totally, you know, your right to be wrong. Um, I'm just kidding. That was not good. That sounded very proudful and boastful. But um, one of the things that drives me a little bit nuts about the American culture and thought line is this idea that I'm going to um, live my life, retire off into the sunset and, and be done with things. I'm going to go play golf and live on a resort and, you know, for the rest of my life and be done. Let me tell you something. Biblically speaking, that's not really biblical. Um, the Bible talks a lot about in your older age, using your wisdom for the benefit and the good of others around you. Um, you so for example, you see things like in the, in the book of Titus, when Paul is addressing his young kind of Padawan learner in, in the faith, he, he speaks of, of Titus and, and he, he, he says, you know, Titus admonished the older women in the church to grab those young ladies and teach them and speak to them and raise them up in wisdom. You see Paul throughout his entire life taking young guys underneath his wings and raising them up. Timothy and, and Titus and all of these, Silas and all of these guys that he would raise up, right, to, to now be pastors of churches and leaders in churches and, and so on. And, and so my thought line for, for some of you here is, listen, um, we, we definitely, you know, we're only seven years old as a church. We've, I think we've got a pretty good healthy balance, um, but we do have young people that need wisdom. Man, can you grab those younger ladies and, and say like, th listen, this is, this is how I am, and this is, oh man, I messed up here, and, and, and so learn from those things. Grab the younger guys. You know, I love like, like hearing stories from people, and, and okay, you, you've been married 50 years? Okay, what'd you do? How, 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 how'd you make it last? Like, like, what's going on? And they tell you, like, this is what I did. I totally blew it here. I totally no, I killed it here. I totally messed up here. I totally was amazing here. Like, I, I did all these things, and I'm like, okay, um, you know, note to self, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, you know, so that I can learn from other people. We, we need this, we need wisdom, we need um, these things. And, and so she's coming in and, and she's, she's saying like, I'm going to redeem this, like I'm going to redeem my time. One of the ways that God can redeem our sin and stupidity is by um, us sharing those things with the younger generation. <laughs> Yeah, when we first got married, I did this, and then I, like, yelled at my wife, and I did this, and, like, you're like, okay, don't ever do that, you know? Don't, don't ever do that. Like, you, you learn and you grow in, in those things, and so my, my admonishment to you, especially for those of you that are older, we need your wisdom. How'd you do it? How'd you make it? Um, where, you know, how'd you... How'd you um, lead in this area? And you're like, well, but you know, I messed up and I sinned. Some people might, one of the things, you know, for us is we have a tendency to, um, to dominate our lives sometimes around our failures or our feelings of inadequacy or our shortcomings or bloody knees. And we think, well, like, you know what, how can Jesus ever use that or want to use that? 
But Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, can take those things to help shape and mold and use what's behind you for future generations so that others can learn and others can grow. So you got to cultivate legacy. Cultivate legacy. Cultivate a, 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 an attitude of, of, listen, I'm going to love my in-laws, I'm going to raise my kids right, and when I get older, I'm going to teach others how to avoid pitfalls so that we are a good healthy, vibrant church who's got wisdom in our older folks, who's got energy in our younger folks, and, and we can create a good balance that way. And number three, and we'll close out with this, you got to cultivate longing. Notice verse 13, the beloved Solomon, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen for your voice, let me hear it, the Shulamite Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. What I love about this is, is, remember, this is a musical. They're singing back and forth to one another. They're locked in, hand in hand, face to face, eyes to eyes. They're singing. It's a song. Uh, it's like Diana Ross and Lionel Richie, you know? And like... Endless Love, you know that song? Your eyes. You know, I, like, I won't sing it for you. My endless love. Right? You know, just like they're singing. Because the idea is here that their love is endless. They're, and, and notice they closed the book the way it opened. Notice what she says. She says, make haste, my beloved. Be like a gazelle, a young stag on the mountains of spices. How'd she open the book? She opened the book with very controversial words. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. <laughs> That's how the book starts out. You know it's going to be a good book when it starts like that. <laughs> and, and so she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And she closes, let him pursue me like a stag on the mountains. The idea for, for both, both verses is this idea of pursuit, this idea of longing, of cultivating longing after one another. One of the things that I've heard from couples who have been married a long, long time is that there is a constant pursuit of one another within that marriage relationship. Meaning they are pursuing each other. They are cultivating this longing after one another. You could say they are dating their mate, date your mate. They're, they're going after one another. And I, I believe that we as believers... I pray that we as a church would go day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, serving the Lord together with gladness, and that may our hearts pursue one another, longing after one another within our marriage relationships. It's not going to be easy. It's hard. But God has given us the tools to, to repent and confess and forgive. He's laid out the model for which we can um, fight well, get counsel, how to respond to forgiveness, regardless of the stage of life. And, and when we do that, when we seek Jesus first and foremost, when we rest in him, find gladness in him, pursue him, then we can have marriages and relationships that are healthy and vibrant and strong. And even though marriage isn't for eternity, let me tell you, you can eternally waste your marriage if it's not built up in Christ. If it's not built up in Jesus. Because let me tell you, in love, dating, marriage, sex, physical intimacy, all of those things, Christ is the only thing that matters in the end. It's the only thing that matters in the end. A right heart and a right relationship with him. As we close, three things. Three things I, I want to take from this, and I'm going to Wrap it up real quick here. Number one, ahava. Remember that word, ahava. Dig in love. A love that digs in, a love that's no matter what, I'm going to be here, I'm not going anywhere. You know, God's design for marriage, his design for marriage has a reason and a purpose. He even told us that, that what he's brought together, let no man separate. Let no man separate. And see, marriage isn't about finding a way out of your issues, but rather finding a way through your issues, finding a way through it. And we can't allow hard hearts to prevail. 
We need to be willing to soften our hearts to the things that Jesus wants. And a couple that is really truly seeking Jesus in all areas of their life and in their marriages will will be a couple that will actually work through the problems. The problem is when one of the couple or one of the person within the relationship doesn't want anything to do with Jesus and the other, you know, is trying to do things the right way. I'm not saying marriage is easy, but let me tell you, it's never too late for a miracle. When you got two people that are focused on Jesus and you let Jesus shape you and mold you to his image, man, God can move mightily. He can move in amazing ways. And some of you here this morning, maybe you're here and you're, you're thinking about getting a divorce. Yeah, I really, truly do believe that divorce is not God's best plan for your life. And it's not. And if couples would learn to fight for one another rather than with one another, the quality of the relationship would dramatically change. And I know the thought line is like, Fernando, you don't understand. You don't understand what he's done. You don't. I get that. But the idea of saying today, listen, I'm going to forgive. It's going to hurt. And I'm going to cry, but I'm willing to forgive. Is something that God can work mightily in. See, the enemy wants you to feel like you're alone, that you're the only one going through it. That's not the case. Or the idea of like, we're just not compatible. Nobody's compatible. <laughs> like, do you know that? Like, nobody's compatible. Like, we're all human. We all have our own free will. We all have our own propensities, proclivities, and bents. And I've told you guys this a few times before, but I'll say this. Finding the one, you'll never find. Finding the one is like finding Bigfoot, unicorns, and aliens. Like, they they don't exist. And don't you dare send me a link about aliens, okay? I... I told you, like, don't, but Fernando, like, this video has a little bright light that flickers. It was probably a firefly, bro. Like, like, it's not an alien. Like, you'll never find the one I am going to put, I've told you guys, I'm going to put a book together in my 80s when I retire um, on all of your emails <laughs> called This Is What I Live Through. I don't know, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Listen, marriage is difficult. You're not going to ever find the one. And it's, you know, the easy thing to do is get out. Walk away, start over. But I really do believe that marriage and marriages are worth fighting for. On a side note, I'll say this. Um, As Christians, we have a tendency to kick our own and beat them up when they're down. And the idea, well, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. Yes, God hates divorce. But God doesn't hate the divorced. And, and so the idea for us, there's an important distinction. God hates sin, but he doesn't hate the sinner. And I know that you're probably carrying around um, a lot of baggage and guilt, and you don't feel victory or peace or joy. Listen, Romans 8.1 tells us that we, we um, have no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And our God is a God of second chances whether you're divorced or an alcoholic or just a straight-up liar. Our God is a God of second chances. So don't let the, the, the devil take the joy in your life. And number two, in-laws, outlaws, and other people. I'm trying to close up all of Song of Solomon here. In-laws, outlaws, and other people. When a couple gets married... Genesis tells us that, that you're to leave, cleave, and weave, that a, a, a man is to leave his father's house, um, go to his wife, cleave, right, be joined together and become one flesh, weave. And, and I don't know if you've ever noticed that section of scripture, because it's a really interesting section of scripture that God would say, hey, you know, Adam, leave your father's house, be joined to your wife, and become one flesh. Imagine the conversation, like he's looking at Eve like, what's a mother? What's a father? You know, he didn't have parents. God made him. They didn't have kids yet. But see, God knew 
instinctively that, well, they're, they're, we're going to have kids, and there's going to be mothers, and there's going to be fathers, and there has to be a set order to things. And so the role of a parent and in-laws and, and, and you know, children, they're, they're very, very intricate, very important. And, and the first thing that I want to say is this. For those of you that have um, kids, is that there should be at some point in your life where on a consistent basis, um, at least from time to time, you have this thought that I am preparing my kids and I am preparing myself for their launch and for their release. Because they're only yours temporarily. You have to release them. Psalm 127 says, children are a heritage from the Lord. They are a gift, the New Living says, and I would say even just a temporary gift. And so there's, you've got to be raising them to say, listen, I am raising you to launch you out. I am raising you to send you out. I am raising you to, to be a, a productive person in society, a, a good husband, a good wife. I am raising you because there has to come a point where, where Christianity becomes their faith and their faith alone, not based off of you not based off of uh, their grandparents. It's got to become their own faith, and they're going to probably need to make some decisions uh, along the way with that. There's got to come a point where, where they are no longer relying on you. doesn't mean um, that you don't help them or support them or, or love them or any of those things, but there's got to come a point where they move on. And for those of you that are, are, are young and getting married, um, there's got to come a point where you leave, cleave, and weave, meaning, meaning you can move out of your parents' house and move 3,000 miles away, but still haven't left your father and mother. And so every time you get into a fight, well, I can't believe he did that, and you call your mom and, and your dad, and no, there's got to come a point where you leave, cleave, and weave. You need to forge that type of idea. It doesn't mean you desert your family, you know, you love them and so on, but your allegiances shift. A young man getting married, his mother is no longer the dominant female in his life. It's his wife. A young uh, woman getting married, her father is no longer the dominant male in her life. It's her husband. And this is the reason why you've got to commend your mate in front of your father and mother. You've got to extol their virtues in front of them. Uh, talk about their good points. Never complain about your spouse in front of your parents. Never use negative language because that will make it difficult for your parents to ever love and respect your mate as they should. And so you've, you've got to cultivate those things. And number three, and we'll close with this. From this day forward, you guys know those words, right? Right? You know the famous wedding vows in sickness and in health, for richer, for poor. From this day forward, so help me God. We need the Lord in our lives, in our marriages, to love another person unconditionally. We need help from Jesus to overlook those offenses. We need his help to guard against temptation uh, with coworkers and, and the internet and so on, we need help to become more like Christ every day. But by making, listen, let me put it this way, making him your one, making him your one, he can make us and our spouse one, and no one can un-one what God makes one. Again, making him your one, he can make us and our spouse one, and no one can un-one what God makes one. You can't have the marriage you want without God's help. You can't. And that's why from this day forward, you've got to determine within your heart to say, I, I want that. 80 years, good marriage, good kids, good life. From this day forward, I'm going to start fresh. From this day forward, things are going to be different. From this day forward, you can find healing. From this day forward, we're going to be more intimate. From this day forward, I'm going to forgive you. From this day forward, I'm going to offer forgiveness. Remember, the past is in the past, and you can't change it, but God can change your future. And what the enemy meant for evil, God can use for good. And so it has to start with you, though, today from this day forward. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we
we worship you and thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I know, dear God, you desire to do a work within us from this day forward. Maybe you're here this morning and that's you. You know, you don't have a right relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here and and things have been topsy-turvy at home, but you want to make a new start from this day forward. I I would just ask that you would have the boldness to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. I I want to pray for you. I I want to lift you up to the Lord and ask that God would work a mighty work within your marriage because nothing can unone what God makes one. Is there anyone here this morning? God bless you and you. Anyone else? Dear God, I thank you for those hands. You know their heart. I pray, dear God, that from this day forward, you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would give them the fruits of the Spirit in gentleness and self-control and humility. Pray, dear God, that you would work in them and and fill them and and empower them to be the man or woman that you want them to be. I thank you, dear God, for your grace and your mercy in our lives. And I pray, dear Jesus, that we would be a a church where where marriages and singles and and young adults and and kids and older folks would, would seek to honor you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, we're gonna...